Thank you. So hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Robert Boyd, and I invite you to this, the uh, second day of our uh, Shallow Town Symposium. The Shallow Towns Symposium is an annual event going back to the year uh, 2012. Uh, the uh, participants, uh, you can find them on our website and you will see how distinguished the uh, speakers are that we've had at uh, the symposium. And uh, the speakers are no less uh, distinguished uh, uh, this year. There's a few uh, 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 specifics about how this works, especially if you were not here uh, yesterday. Uh, we are, uh, well, obviously it's, it's a virtual uh, symposium. We have two components. One is the talks by our two speakers. Then we can break out into a poster session in, in a different room. And for technical reasons that I certainly don't understand, we are doing the present session in Zoom, but the poster session in Teams. Uh, the, uh, uh, both speakers uh, have agreed to uh, take questions at the end of their talks. Uh, we ask you to write your questions down and uh, put them in the chat window. Uh, when the talk is over, my colleague, uh, Jeremy Upham, will be uh, reading the questions uh, to, to, to the speakers. So, uh, yeah, more about uh, the Shallow Town Symposium. We were, uh, Paul and I put this together and then one of the uh, vice president level people at the university said, what are you trying to accomplish here? Is it to bring in money? And uh, we said, no, not really. That could be an indirect consequence, but this is a party in celebration of the field of photonics. It's like you, you, you have a good friend and you just have a party to, to uh, help celebrate with your friend. And, and that's sort of what we are, what we're going on today. Okay, so our, our first uh, speaker today is, uh, is uh, Lucas Novotny. Uh, he has lived everywhere, I exaggerate. Uh, he was born in Czechoslovakia. The uh, family then moved to Switzerland. Uh, uh, Lucas received all of his education in, in Switzerland, uh, including a diploma degree and later a PhD from uh, KTH uh, uh, Zurich. Uh, in 1996, he then came to the U.S., did a postdoctoral appointment at Pacific Northwest National Laboratories. From 1999 to 2012, he was a professor of optics at the University of Rochester. That is how I got to know Lucas. We were both on the same faculty of, of a reasonably small department. Uh, in uh, 2012, he left uh, Rochester to uh, take a professorial, professorial appointment again at ETH Zurich. Uh, he tells me that he speaks five languages, but we will ask him as a favor to use only one language today in, in presenting his talk. So Lucas, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bob. Um, let's see, I have to share screen here. Okay, so let me start with thanking you and the other organizers for having me. Uh, this is a great honor to speak uh, at this symposium. Um, I will speak about levitodynamics, and this is all about the levitated object that you see here. Um, and uh, the objective of doing this is actually spelled out here. This is our mantra. A quantum phenomenon is a phenomenon only if it is a recorded phenomenon. So that's what we are striving for. We want to measure something that has a clear quantum signature. Okay, so where does this name come from or what does it mean? And here I'm referring to a very recent uh, review article that just appeared in Science. Levitodynamics is levitation and control of microscopic objects in vacuum. So here you see levitation across the length scales. We know 
you know, the entire atomic physics, okay, is based on holding atoms and atomic clouds in place to trap them and to cool them. Um, and then we also have here, okay, on the very macroscopic uh, scale, levitation as a means to circumvent friction. And now this intermediate scale here, the microscopic scale, it's like 10 to the minus four to 10 to the minus seven meters. This is like a mesoscopic uh, scale that actually is very attractive to pursue different um, research questions. Now, some of these research questions are motivated by quantum science. They basically very much um, um, refer to the quantum classical transition. There are questions of material science that can be addressed in this length uh, um, uh, scale, especially you know, materials under extreme uh, stress. Then uh, non-equilibrium physics, we can look at stochastic processes um, very far out of equilibrium for, for which you know, the theoretical framework is not well established. And then, of course, as such a levitated object, because it doesn't feel a lot of interaction with its environment, so very low friction, is a very good sensor for any forces that act on it from the outside. Okay, so what I'm going to do in this presentation, I will narrow myself down to this quantum question, macroscopic superpositions. So in a nutshell, what we are striving for is to put this object into two places at once. If time allows towards the end, I will also talk a little bit about the other um, um, topics, but I, I, I think um, for the sake of um, not being too superficial, I will mainly focus on this question here. Okay, so before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the people who are involved in the results that I'm going to discuss and present. This is the group um, of ETH working on this uh, project. There is Martin Frimmer, he's a senior scientist who has been with me since the beginning here. Then Dominic Windy, Felix Teben Johans, Andre Militaro, Maria Luisa Matana, and Massimiliano Rossi. These are former students who moved on other locations, but they left behind very strong results. And these are the PIs of co collaborating groups. So Romain Kidon, um, he was previously at ICFO and I started this research line with Romain. Now he is my neighbor more or less. Then um, Oriol Romero Izart, he's a theoretical uh, physicist at ICOCI, that's the Institute of Quantum Optics and Quantum Information at the University of Innsbruck. Then Christoph De Lago at the University of Vienna. And Tracy Northup also in Innsbruck. So the motivation is, is spelled out here. So we aim at measuring in a parameter regime where no one has measured before. And the, one of the objectives for doing this is to generate these macroscopic quantum superpositions. Now what that means, I will explain. Um, so what is a macroscopic quantum superposition? Well, most of you will certainly be familiar with the Young's double slit experiment. You know? If a particle that behaves as a wave is sent okay, on, a, on two slits, then we will see an interference pattern. And the interpretation in a particle picture is that the particle went through two slits simultaneously. So in principle, we could separate these two paths and then the particle exists in two locations simultaneously. We can just say its wave function is delocalized over a long or large distance. Now, such macroscopic quantum superpositions have been done, okay, and they were very um, uh, important in the development of uh, quantum uh, science. 
I mean, um, with light, um, we're pretty much used to it, okay? But it has been done with electrons in 1927. And then, you know, the, the challenge was to scale up the mass, to go heavier and heavier, and thereby make the object um, more and more classical. So here in 2019, the group of um, Marcus Arndt in, at the University of uh, Vienna, he managed to observe interference fringes in such a Young's double slit experiment with organic molecules. And this holds the record so far. Now, what we want to do is now jump up four or five orders of magnitude and do similar games with a nanoparticle, a nanoparticle about 100 nanometers in diameter. Now, what's different here is that what you see down here, this is like a top-down development, no? So we, we, we take one electron or one elementary particle, okay, and then we have an atom. So, so we scale, you know, these elementary um, uh, units up till we have a molecule. Uh, here, actually, we're coming top down. So this is a top down approach to quantum mechanics. We take something that is inherently classical and we want to force it to behave quantum mechanical. Now, this is a program um, with colleagues of mine. So it's the four us of us, Oriol, uh, Romero Izart, and Roman Kidon, whom I already introduced and the group of Marcus Aspelmeyer at the University of Vienna. And the project um, that uh, they're engaged in is called Q-Extreme. And my presentation will be um, presenting you here the first steps into this direction. I must say we are only at the beginning, okay? This is a six years program that just started, okay? So, uh, don't expect that I show you any macroscopic quantum superpositions. We at the very beginning stage. Okay, so what? Why? Why is this interesting? Okay, why should we do these quantum superpositions? The reason is, you know, there are there are theoretical um, ideas or proposals for how a quantum collapse ha happens. Um, and and these, these, um, uh, these, uh, these theoretical models are referred to as collapsed models. Okay, so, so like the wave function collapse is, is somehow um, generated here by spontaneous localization. This is one theory. Then, you know, because of gravity, there's uh, especially like um, um, Roger Penrose, okay, formulated some of these theories. Then uh, there is um, 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 uh, an equation, okay, that co yeah, uh, 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 co connects Newtonian kind of equation of motion to our quantum mechanics, um, and so on. I, I don't want to go into the details here because I don't understand it myself. I just know there are many open questions. There is no real test ground here because in order to test this, you need objects of large mass. Okay, so this is the outline of what I'm going to tell you. I first give you an introduction. I will then talk about photon recoil heating, which is actually the dominant um, mechanism of uh, decoherence in our experiments right now. Um, I will talk about active and passive feedback cooling. So we want to bring this particle, this levitated particle to rest and by basically bringing it to rest, we, we, we refer to cooling. So cooling means, you know, bringing the center of mass motion to rest. And then if time allows, I will talk a little bit about how to make use of all this toolbox here for quantum sensing, and then I give an outlook. So the game starts actually with Arthur Ashkin. Uh, this is one of his first papers on the subject of a levitation. So he managed to levitate already, you know, in the late um, 60s, particles both in gas phase and in liquid phase. And a lot of ideas of what we do today are already contained in there, and especially this sentence, 
the extension to vacuum of the present experiments on particle trapping in potential wells would be of interest since then any motions are frictionless. So we ask ourselves, well, nothing is frictionless. There's always friction. But what, okay, will be the friction if we are in a space that has no molecules? So our toolbox here is illustrated here. We have a particle and we, we adhere here to a purely classical description. Okay, and this particle has a position coordinate R and it is irradiated by an electromagnetic field. And this electromagnetic field exerts forces on the particle. So here we have Newton's equation of motion, okay? What we do here, we average the force over the cycles or the, the oscillation cycles of the electromagnetic field because of the inertia of a mechanical system, okay? The, the, the particle will not be able to follow, okay, the, the, the instantaneously the electric field. If we write this out here for a small particle in the dipole limit, okay, so that means the size of the particle is much smaller, okay, than the relevant length scales, which means the wavelength of the radiation, then we can, we can restrict this force to the leading dipole term. So you see alpha here is the polarizability of this particle and the polarizability as a real and an imaginary part. And here are just the fields, the external fields that act on the particle. And I've written this in two terms because the first term can be written as a potential. So this is a conservative force and this is our trapping potential. Okay, this is the laser tweezer. On the other hand, this second term here is non-conservative. And this is essential because ultimately we want to control the motion of the particle. In order to do this, we have to exert work, okay? And to do work means we need a non-conservative force. And this is through this term here. And I will illustrate this very shortly here. Um, so, you know, we have the laser tweezer. Usually this is um, operated in, in, um, in gas or in solution, which, which, has a, a, which has a viscosity. And because it's viscous, it has also a Stokes drag force. So a particle that basically is pulled into the laser focus will get stuck just because of the friction. But if, you know, if, if we evacuate this whole thing, okay, then there is no friction. There will be nothing to hold this particle back. And this is like a skateboarder that enters a half pipe. You know? The half pipe here is a gravitational potential. And so the, 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 the skateboarder that enters with a certain velocity, if there is no, velo if no friction, the, the, the skateboarder will come out here with the same velocity. Oh, it's just conservation of energy. So, you know, we cannot hold the um, uh, skateboarder in place. So this laser tweezer kind of thing will not work in vacuum. Every particle that is pulled into the focus will leave the focus. So we have to exert, okay, some non-conservative force or to generate artificial friction. And, you know, just to give you one possibility here, we can just time things. When the skateboard is here at the very bottom, okay, what we do is we just increase the potential well. Well, then definitely doesn't have enough, you know, energy to come out there. So, so we tricked the skateboard and thereby we trapped it. So that already says, okay, timing is everything, okay? So the temporal control of the fields is what ultimately allows us to generate viscous forces. Okay, so I will jump a little bit ahead because this is still the introduction. Just believe me, we managed, okay, in 2012 to trap such a particle in vacuum. And then we monitored the scattered light. Now, what you see here 
is the laser light that comes here from this objective. So this, the, the, the laser comes from the right to the left, scatters at the particle. And because it scatters, you know, some of the photons reach the camera and that's why we can make a picture. But some of these photons can also be directed to a detector. And there they can do some kind of a balanced detection to pick up the motion. So what, what you see here is a photo detector signal calibrated okay against you know the motion okay the, the, the displacement from trap center as a function of time and of course we have such a such an oscillation also along the y direction along the z direction so you see this is a like a harmonic oscillator with a slowly varying envelope and if we fourier transform this well what we get is a lorentzian okay and that's what is shown here. So we take here this oscillation, we Fourier transform it, and then we, we form the absolute square of the Fourier transform. And this is what we refer to as the power spectral density, okay? So we just move from time domain to frequency domain, and we just get rid of the phase by just looking at the amplitude. So what it looks like, for the motion before, this is x, that would be this blue curve here. It's a nice Lorentzian. This is a logarithmic scale. And you see there is a center frequency, and that's the oscillation frequency that you see here. Now, in the y direction, we have a slightly different oscillation frequency. That's because the laser is polarized, okay? And, and, and the curvature in the focus is different in the X and in the Y direction. And we also have an oscillation along the longitudinal direction along the um, laser axis. But what you notice, we have different frequencies, but the width of these Lorentzians is the same. This is because this was acquired at elevated pressure and there is still a viscous drag. Okay, so the damping here in all directions is given by the same medium. Okay, this is the gas, and each direction samples the same gas, and that's why here the width is the same. Now, if the particle leaves the trap, then we are left here with the background signal, and this is our noise floor. So typically our noise floor is one picometer per root hertz, and by now, actually, we moved this down to 0 0.01 picometer per root hertz. How to bring this really down to this regime, I will, I will explain you later. So a little bit jargon. OK, so if I say cooling, what I mean is I want to bring the particle to standstill. So let me express the energy the mean energy, okay, of this oscillator. Well, I can just express it in terms of a mean square amplitude, okay? Because it's a harmonic oscillator, it's weakly damped, okay? So here I only um, consider the potential energy because there is a periodic exchange between kinetic and, and potential energy. So I, I can, um, um, at low, low pressures, okay, where there is very little friction, I can just express it as a mean square amplitude or the variance. And omega zero is our oscillation amplitude. And now I could just say, okay, I, I equate this energy in, term, in, in terms of a temperature. Right? I, I can just say, I express the energy in units of Kelvin. And in order to do this, I have to multiply with Boltzmann's constant. And because it's only one degree of freedom, I have a one half here. Okay, so that's, you know, um, the jargon, okay, in the field. If people say center of mass cooling, they express the energy in terms of a temperature. And of course, bringing the particle at standstill, okay, means just bringing the temperature down. So in the quantum business, okay, I can also equate this energy with, you know, a multiple or in units of an energy quantum, assuming this will be a quantum oscillator. Okay, I know that, okay, we have, we have equidistance energy levels separated by um, H bar omega zero. So omega zero is my oscillation frequency. 
Okay, and so I take this energy, I divide by h bar omega zero, and I have an n, okay, a, a unitless um, a number that tells me um, um, how cold I am. So this quantum ground state here, this is referred as n equals zero, the quantum um, uh, ground state. Okay, so basically, no, n equal zero. Yeah, actually, we just subtract here one half. So this is zero and this will be one. Okay, so if n is smaller than one, that means, okay, that, 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 that's what people refer to as the quantum ground state or quantum ground state cooling, because they have less population up here than down here. Okay, so how do we measure this in experiment? Okay, the detector shows this, okay? So there's a photo detector and then we send this, okay, to some digitizing card and it spits out bits. And the, these bits, okay, they, they come as a function of time. Well, we just calibrate this, okay? So we, we basically displace the particle by a known amount. This can be done, for example, by putting like one charge on it and exposing it to an electric field of that, that we know very accurately, like in a plate capacitor, then we know how much the particle displaced. So we can calibrate this amplitude against position. We also can pick out the oscillation with a phase locked loop, for example, very accurately. And we also can measure the mass. So just based on this, okay, I'm calculating here the variance we can determine what the energy is. But this is not how we do it, because here we don't know whether other modes are at work, okay? Um, so what we do is we Fourier transform this. And when we Fourier transform this and take again the absolute square of the Fourier transform, which we call the power spectral density, then it looks like that, okay? So, so, so this is indeed okay. The, the Fourier transform of this uh, of this trace. So you see again at hundred what is it hundred forty five? Um, so so this is kilohertz. Okay, uh, hundred forty five kilohertz. Um, you see the peak here. That's the that's the center frequency and the line width. And what you see um, also here, there's a background because we have shot noise on the detector. Okay, so, so typically this is subtracted because that doesn't belong to the signal. And then what we are left is, is with this Lorentzian and this Lorentzian we just fit. And if we integrate this Lorentzian, this, this Lorentzian here, okay, then we get the mean square amplitude. So this is how it's done, okay? We go to the frequency domain, okay? And we just integrate the Lorentzian and that gives us ultimately the energy. Then we can express it in terms of a temperature, or we can express it here in an effective occupation number. Okay, so that's the procedure. Now, how do we cool this particle? Now, this is one of the very first paper that set you know, the stage for, um, um, I would say, um, optomechanics. Um, this is by Khaled Karai. And here is just a classical equation of motion. Okay, so this is the harmonic oscillator. Here is a thermal force, random kicks of molecules. And here he has a feedback force. And he, he says here in this paper, the essence of cooling is based on the fact that the optically induced forces acting on the lever are delayed with respect to a sudden change in the lever position. So this term here has to have a time delay with respect to the motion. And we need just the right time delay. And the time delay is 90 degrees. Okay, why? Because if this is 90 degrees, it amounts here to a velocity dependence. And if we have a velocity dependent term, then this is associated with damping or friction. So if this is proportional to velocity, it just adds to this term and thereby increases the damping. And in order to bring something to rest, we have to damp as good as possible. Okay, now damping, okay, slows it down. But you see that we have also thermal forces and 
these thermal forces heat the system. So there will be a balance between heating and cooling, and I will get back to this. But anyway, so uh, what I want, would like to point out now, this, this delayed force acting on the system can be done in two ways, with a passive feedback or an active feedback. So the active feedback monitors okay, the motion of the particle. And then there is some logic that basically feeds that information back on the electromagnetic field. And in a cavity, this is done autono auto autono autonomously. Okay, so if the particle moves, it detunes the cavity field and thereby, you know, the laser power or, or, the, or the, the power in the cavity goes down. And if the, if the power goes down and the radiation pressure on the particle goes down and the particle basically moves back to its original position. So any kind of deviation from the center Okay, it's counteracted, okay, with either reduced or enhanced uh, radiation pressure. Okay, so we, we are pursuing both approaches, but I will mostly uh, focus here on the active uh, feedback, because it, it is it more um, closely relates to the measurement problem of uh, quantum mechanics. So to, to explain you, um, you know, what's going on um, in, in this cooling dynamics, we're just going to look here at this classical equation of motion. And now what I did is this term, okay, I just assumed I set my parameters right such that this system is velocity, uh, this term is velocity dependent, and I can add it to this term. And then, you know, if I make the gas very small, okay, the pressure very low, then of course this term will be dominated by the feedback. Okay, so this is what you see here. So this gamma here is, is given, okay, or determined by the feedback gain. And this term, okay, are still some residual collisions with the background gas, okay? And, and, and these collisions, they heat the system, okay? So here we have, here we have, you know, damping and here we have heating. Now we, we can just look at what, how, how does the energy of such a system, you know, transition to a steady state. And, and, and here we have um, this equation, this comes just from a Fokker-Planck equation. And you see that the, uh, the, 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 the mean energy changes as a function of the balance of cooling and heating. That this is like your car, no? You put your a foot on, on the gas pedal and on the, on, on the brake simultaneously, okay? And starting from some initial velocity, you will assume some steady state velocity. And, and the business here is exactly the same. In the steady state, okay, there is no change of the mean energy, okay? So cooling will equal to heating, and that will determine the steady state. So I can solve this equation very easily. This, the solution is down here, okay? And let's start, uh, let's assume I start with some initial energy, okay? This is E0 here. Then I will transition here exponentially to a steady state, which is E infinity, with a given rate, um, a capital, um, uh, no, no, small gamma, okay? And this, that's my, that's my um, uh, feedback gain my damping. But what is important is once I reach the steady state, the steady state energy, or we refer to it as temperature, the steady state temperature will be given as the ratio of heating to cooling. And we will always have heating and we will, uh, we, we have to be very clever in designing uh, a system with, that allows us to exert maximum uh, damping so that uh, this steady state comes uh, pretty close to zero. Okay, so let me talk about photon recoil heating. What happens, okay, if now we go really to very high, uh, low, low pressures? So there is no gas anymore. And so we, we cool the system, okay, um, uh, to a very low temperature or to very low energy, and then we switch off the feedback. 
So, so now the particle will reheat oh, because there's nothing that cools, okay? Because we switched off to cooling, but there's still something in the environment that kicks it and, and, and heats it up. Okay, so again, at, 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 at you know, higher pressures is dominated by the gas, okay? And you see that it transitions here into a steady state after, you know, seconds, okay? Uh, you know, the, I'd like to point out, okay, that, you know, it, the system is oscillating, okay, at 150 kilohertz, okay? But um, this is over the course of, you know, seconds, okay, that these oscillations, they come into a steady state. And, you know, one run will not do, okay? Because each reheating cycle here is out of equilibrium. So in order to have here a statistically representative trace, we have to do this experiment like, you know, 1,000, 10,000 times. So, so these blue dots, okay, they are the average already over like probably 1,000 runs. And the red curve is just, you know, the, um, the uh, solution of our equation. So, but now we are going to very low uh, pressures and, you know, just by scaling to do this experiment, this would take probably, you know, the lifetime of a PhD to do one, one uh, reheating cycle here. So it's not a clever um, experiment to do. But I, I'd like here just to um, express now this heating equation, okay, in units here of my effective occupation number, okay? And I, I can now have a similar equation just here for my N, okay, or my occupation number. And, and my gamma here, this capital gamma here, this is just an abbreviation for this thing. This is the heating rate. Okay, um, so the solution of this is shown here again. Okay, I, I start here from an initial occupation and this is my steady state occupation. And I transition between the two exponentially. And now, um, if I look at what the steady state occupation is, I just have all my heating term divided by all my cooling terms. And here I can just list whatever, okay, my fantasy allows. So first of all, I have my thermal uh, contribution. This is the collision with my molecules. And here I have my feedback noise, okay? But, you know, I, I told you that, first of all, I'm in very high vacuum and I switched off the feedback. I let the system reheat. So I don't have these two things, okay? And then I only end up with, with this contribution, the contribution of the light field itself, okay? And now if, if I say that this is only the light field that contributes and I plug this in here and I linearize this, you know, because to reach the steady state, I need, as I said, four years, okay? So I will, in my experiment, only be able to sample this linear slope up here, okay? So if I linearize this, uh, this thing, then I see that it starts from my initial occupation and then goes linearly, and the slope of it is what we call the photon recoil rate, and it, we can just express it in this form. This is the scattered power from the particle. Capital omega zero is the oscillation frequency of the harmonic oscillator. Small omega zero is the light frequency. M is the mass and C is the speed of light. And the one fifth here is, because we don't have a mirror, we have a particle and the particle scatters as a dipole. So this one fifth, okay, takes into account the direction which we measure. In this case, it would be the direction perpendicular to the polarization. So we can test this and that's what we did a while ago. So here is our formula, okay? And um, now we quantitatively can test in the experiment that we get the same number, that it scales correctly with the particle size because if we change the particle size, we change the scattered power and it also scales correctly here with the with the laser power so we arrived here in a regime where the heating of the particle is no longer given by the gas but it is just the recoils imparted on the particle by 
the photons that, um, uh, that collide with it. Okay, so now let me go to active feedback cooling. Um, so um, active feedback cooling has been done on single atoms. Okay, has also been done by the group of Mark Raisin on uh, bigger microspheres. And um, we actually followed their footsteps, but we implemented this a little bit a different protocol. We looked at a parametric control. So imagine you put the marble in a ball and uh, this marble is just oscillating back and forth because there's no friction. And now, uh, you know, your task is to bring this marble to rest. So you have this ball in your hands. Okay, you're observing this marble. And what will you do? Well, you're going to shake, okay, the whole thing up and down. And this shaking, this shaking is a modulation of the trapping potential. And interestingly, okay, everybody will just figure out how to shake it. Okay, so you will have to shake it at twice the oscillation frequency and with the right phase. Okay, and this is a parametric effect. This is similar to, you know, a child that is accelerating on a swing. Okay, but of course, the child by keeping track of the right phase, okay, with the, with the leg movement relative to the pendulum motion. Okay, can also slow down the motion. Usually they want to accelerate, but you, you can also slow down. So this is um, uh, the protocol that we implemented. We pick out here the oscillation here. We, we, we have the scattered field. Okay, then we basically double the frequency. We do here the phase shift. And then we have like a non-linear damping. Okay, this term can then be folded back to here. And we have like a non-linear damping term that helps us to bring the particle to rest in th all three axes. And we demonstrated this, okay? These are the occupation numbers that we reached uh, a while ago. And then we learned that this parametric game is, is actually nice, but it is not an optimal protocol. So the control engineers here, they have something called optimal control theory. And uh, we learned, okay, that there's an optimal control protocol for our oscillator, and this is cold damping. In a nutshell, this is a nonlinear damping term, okay, because you see there's an x square x dot, okay, but we want actually just an x dot. That would be optimal. And if we only have an x dot here, just a bare, bare velocity dependent term, then this is what is referred to as cold damping. Now, how can we make a linear feedback? Mark Raisin has done this with radiation pressure. So whenever the particle goes to one direction, well, press it back with, with laser light. Well, the problem is you have to align six lasers, okay? And uh, this has its technical limitations and that's why Mark Raisin didn't get to very low temperatures. So what we instead do is we put the charge on this particle and then apply a Coulomb force. Okay, so there's a charge, okay? And we measure the displacement of the charge optically. Okay, so this is a laser field. So here are our detectors. We pick up, okay, the, 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 the displacement from center optically, but then we apply here an electrostatic force, okay, and this electrostatic force has a velocity dependence. Okay, so I would like to emphasize here three things, okay, because you can you can do this levitation in many different ways. So the trap optically, we measure optically because optical measurements are shot noise limited. Okay, that's what optical measurements are good for. But, okay, we exert here a force electrostatically okay? because optical forces, okay, acting on neutral objects, well, they are second order and that's why they're weaker, okay, than, than an electrostatic force. Okay, so we, we are charging this particle and just believe me, we can, we can put a control this charge with single electron 
um, a resolution. We just generate the plasma and then monitor here the force electrostatically, you know, acting on, on, on this sphere. And you see here the electrons, they come and go and so on. And we can also control the sign. But uh, then we can just um, uh, choose, we want 10 electrons on this particle and then we park it in this way. And the charge stays, um, 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 stays, stays constant over the course of days. We've never seen actually charges leaving in high vacuum. So again, the equation of motion um, 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 is shown here. Um, we have now two terms, okay, that heat the particle. One is the shot noise on the detector that we fold back. And we have also the bass, the photons that are kicking the particle that generate the recoil. And now you can work yourself through the theory, which I will do very fast. Then in frequency domain expressed in the power spectral densities, you can cast it in this way. So the energy of the particle will be dominated by two terms. One is the back action, the photons imparting here a momentum recoil. And one term, okay, that goes with the shot noise on the detector. And the optimum here is when these two terms are equal, and this is also referred to as the standard quantum limit. So we exploited this, okay, we came pretty low, but not low enough, because we didn't detect many photons. And this was actually what changed the whole uh, game for us. A student took the time to calculate where the energy is going and the information is going. It doesn't mean where the photons are going because many photons, they don't carry necessarily information, but those that carry the information, where are they going? So the student plotted these information radiation patterns and that told us in which directions do we have to detect the photons. And what we then did is we implemented a heterodyne uh, protocol. That means here we have the trapping laser that traps the particle. The particle oscillates with capital omega along the long axis. And then we interfere, okay, this light field here with a frequency shifted reference beam and we interfere the two. And if we do this, then theory says we should see, okay, centered around our um, carrier here, our frequency shift, okay? So this is typically in the, in the higher megahertz, we should see two sidebands, a red sideband and a blue sideband. And okay, quantum mechanics tells us, okay, that the, the height of these two sidebands is different by one quantum. So this is similar to like Stokes and anti-Stokes scattering in, 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 in Raman spectroscopy. <clears throat> and yes, okay, we were able to do this game and indeed measure these sidebands and you see we arrived here at n equal four. And um, um, just, this is an absolute thermometer. So we don't even have to integrate the areas because just the difference in the peaks, if we can resolve it is one quantum. So this is a calibration free um, experiment. Um, so we just know this is one and then we just count how much we have. So we have N equal four. And then, okay. Well, this is, we, you know, we we're very proud about this because we call this a recorded quantum phenomenon, okay? There is no classical explanation for this asymmetry. It is due to the quantum ground state of a harmonic oscillator. So um, now I will go a little bit fast for the sake of time, okay? Um, this has been in 2020 we realized the reason why we cannot go lower is because there's residual gas molecules. We can never get rid of these gas molecules because our vacuum is not good enough. And there were other things, okay, there were the residual laser noise and so on. Long story short, okay, we built the whole thing in a cryostat. 
that allowed us to uh, you know, achieve uh, ultra high vacuum. So 10 to the minus 12 millibars. This is the setup. So you see here it's a fridge, okay? We estimate, okay, that at the particle, we have only 60 Kelvin, um, although this is like um, a two Kelvin cryostat. But anyway, so this allowed us very recently to uh, reach the quantum brown state. Here you see the you know, sideband asymmetry, which allows us here to extract the occupation number is 066. Then just you know, make sure, okay, that we are not fooled. We resorted also to other measurements. We looked here at the cross correlation between the two sidebands, okay? And also here we get 0.64. And then we also do a homodyne in loop measurement. And here we get 0 0.65. So we reached a quantum ground state. And here I would like to also mention that similar experiments have been done by Aspelmeyer's group. And uh, these two um, papers have been uh, published back to back. OK, um, since then, we also ventured into squeezing and so on. And now. I'm going to skip all this, okay, for the sake of time. So no cavities here and just give you an outlook. So what did we do in this protocol? We ground state cooled. So in order to carry this through, okay, we actually have a sequence of steps that have to be mastered. First of all, we have to expand the wave function. The particle is 100 nanometers, but the ground state wave function is 10 picometers. So as, as long as the wave function of the system is much smaller than the physical size, it's a particle. Okay, so only when the wave function becomes bigger than the particle, we can you know, associate it with a wave. Then we need a nonlinear interaction. Because as long, okay, as we stay within, you know, linear quantum mechanics, we have Gaussian states, and the equation of motion for Gaussian states is the same as for uh, uh, classical systems. So we need a nonlinear interaction to generate a non-Gaussian state, and such a double slip is, in principle, a non-Gaussian operation. And then we have to do a quantum measurement, okay, to measure such a, such a fringe here. And then we have to repeat the whole thing, okay, with the same particle oh, 10,000 times. So this is a big uh, endeavor, okay, but at least, okay, we, we, we managed so far to reach the first step. Now I'd like to say that we can also rotate the particle. This is very interesting. We can have the particle jump between different traps. We can do a lot of simulations by adding here terms to our equation of motion. And this is my summary slide. So we basically managed to cool this particle. We can go to uh, ultra high force sensitivities and rotations. I didn't talk about this, also free fall. Um, um, so I told you mostly about um, quantum control. And uh, what we're also very interested now doing is to address internal degrees of freedom, such as you know, acoustic, acoustic modes uh, through Brion and scattering. So I end up here. I'm sorry I went four minutes over time, um, but I hope um, there are still some minutes left for questions. Thank you very much, okay. Professor Novotny. Uh, Bob, would you like me to go ahead with questions? Yes, please do that. Um, okay, Professor Novotny, uh, the first question um, is, uh, in, your, in your motivation, you showed a levitating train, uh, which uh, I believe is usually performed by superconductivity-based magnetic levitation. Can you speak to the analogies and the contrast between these two approaches to levitation? Yes. Well, first of all, we don't want to levitate trains, but um, the, 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 the train levitation is also applied you know, in, in this field of levitodynamics. Um, so I told you my optical story, okay? Mm -hmm. But there are groups, they levitate in pole traps you know? um, by putting um, a charge on, on, on the system, okay? It's, you, 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 you can... Uh, 
you can uh, slow the particle down electrostatically um, or in you know, RF traps. And, and there's also magnetic trapping. And, and there are different protocols, okay? So, so um, um, magnetic levitation is best done, okay, in a paramagnetic state, okay, where um, 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 if, if your particle is a superconductor, okay, then uh, the particle wants to avoid magnetic field and is trapped in a, in a magnetic field minimum. And, and this approach is being pursued by different groups, um, also by uh, Marcus Aspelmeyer's group. So that's, that's the train kind of um, analogy. So um, yes, um, we do nano trains. Understood. Um, the next question. No, um, before you go there, why yes. are we pursuing this? Because we don't know which is the winning kind of platform. I told you that um, the light generates photon recoil. Okay, and, and that's undesired. Okay, so light always measures. So an optical mm -hmm. trap always measures. And the hope is that an electrostatic or a magnetostatic trap does no measurements. But of course, there's no free lunch. We know, okay, from the ion trapping community, there is anomalous heating and so on. But this has to be explored. Where are the limits of the different platforms? Okay, now I, I'm ready for the second. Thank you. Um, the next question, um, some people talk about quantum friction as the dominant source of friction in an absolute vacuum. Do you believe this? Um, quantum friction, I would refer to vacuum friction. No? Um, I'm, I'm not sure if this is the same thing, um, uh, but yes. So ultimately, um, a vacuum friction goes back to you know, uh, a theory paper by Einstein and Hopf in 1910. So it just says that a charge neutral body, a polarizable body in a, in a thermal background field will experience a viscous drag force. So therefore such a system has to come to rest. But this is only in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a in a in a thermal field. Okay, so this does not apply to like uh, zero point fluctuations. I see. Um, next, uh, do you see this technique as being scalable up to trap multiple particles? Yes, yes, and there are also experiments underway. So uh, people are aiming for entangling two particles in a in a in a cavity. Okay, so cooling both particles uh, very very cold, and then because uh, both particles are coupled to the same oscillator, which means the the, the cavity. Uh, there are protocols uh, that envision to entangle the motion of these two particles. Yes. Um, the next question here is, uh, when the cooling is successful, do you have a way to give a precise estimate for the temperature inside the particle? Ah, very good question. Yes, um, I'm skipping usually this part because this is uh, what bothers us. So what we can do is to trap silica particles or quartz, you know? that's it, okay? Everything else burns. So if I say we're cooling to the quantum ground state, we're cooling the center of mass motion, but internally the system is damn hot, right? Mm -hmm. So like the sun, okay, there's the sun center of mass motion is only a few Kelvin, but internally it's a couple of thousand Kelvins. So the same thing here, our internal temperature is probably 800 to 1000 degrees Kelvin. And the reason why we can measure this is because we know how the refractive index of glass changes as a function of temperature. That allows us, okay, to, to measure it. Understood. Um, the next question here um, asks if you could discuss analogies with the dynamic Stark effect, which is used to control internal dynamics in molecules. I cannot do that because I lack the knowledge about the dynamic Stark effect applied to molecules. Uh, well, that question was from uh, Dr. Albert Stolo. Perhaps you and he could have that conversation at another time. Uh, I'd love to do this, Albert. Uh, um, the next question I have here is, um, you said that collisions tend to increase the energy of the particle. Why is this? 
um, I might think that for certain conditions, the collisions could remove energy from the particle. Um, now that depends. Depends whether the center of mass energy of the particle is higher than the center of mass energy of a gas molecule. So mm. if I have a very cold gas and a very hot particle, then of course my particle will equilibrate with the gas. Um, Yes, but I, I would say we, we, we see this as just, you know, a conservation of momentum. Every, every molecule that collides with our nanoparticle, okay, it generates a momentum recoil and thereby imparts energy um, as a mm. recoil, similar to the photons. Okay, um, I, I should let you know that for brevity, I'm, I've skipped over many of the compliments on your talk. I hope you'll accept that. Um, but the next question here um, is saying, uh, would it be possible to elaborate on the temperature associated to the rotations? Uh, is one half KBT assigned to each degrees, linear and rotations? Um, good question. Um... In principle, yes. The, the thing is, we are never reaching this limit because we are driving the rotation. So um, uh, to make the particle rotate, we use circularly polarized light and thereby transfer uh, spin angular momentum on the particle. So there is a torque acting on the particle and ultimately, again, it's the friction with the background gas that generate that it sets the steady state rotation. Okay. But uh, let's say we would let okay the particle then equilibrate okay or, or reach a steady state, then ultimately okay the um, in in a, in a background gas okay then then the then the variance, the angular variance should um, um, boil down to half kT per, 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 per rotational degree of freedom. Thank you. Um, I have some other questions here, but in the interest of time, I'm going to curtail it. Um, so what I will do, Professor Novotny, is I will send you these questions with the contact information of the individuals involved and give you a chance to answer it at your mutual leisure. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Thank you all for listening. Bye-bye.